So when I was in elementary school, I went to an after-school program at the Needham Children's Center in the basement of the Christian Scientist Church on Great Plain Avenue. And every Wednesday, they would take us all out to one of several possible activities in downtown Needham. There was candle pin bowling at Needham Bowl Away, a, I would say, charmingly grim establishment in a basement tended solely by a man named Al with a ponytail and a parrot. <laughs> there was karate, which I never quite took to because I've always been both fairly uncoordinated and something of a pacifist. But my favorite activity was pottery at Clay Pat's, a pottery studio appropriately owned by a woman named Pat. I signed up for pottery every chance I could, which is evidenced by the fact that to this day, you could not have dinner at either one of my parents' homes without being served something in an original John Allen. <laughs> Plates, little bowls, pots. I made a replica of my snow boots one year. And I think the crown jewel of my early work was a birdhouse complete with a little satellite dish on the roof and a hot tub hanging off the side. <laughs> so seeing as some of the great joyful moments of my early life were spent sitting at the pottery wheel, turning clay into the objects of my imagination, I've always loved the image of this text, God the potter, gently forming us and smoothing out the rough places, polishing us up nice and beautiful, prepared for some wonderful purpose in the world. That's the image I've always had of this text, a, a gentle and tender image, like, like the one on the cover of your bulletin. It's, it's just a touch-up, just smoothing out the last little imperfection. But then, as I always do and should always do, I spent some time reading the text this week. And I noticed something rather troubling. It's not gentle at all. It's not gentle at all. God the potter isn't just smoothing out the last imperfection. God the potter finds the clay so frustratingly misshapen that there's no choice but to press it flat and start again. And if we were to keep reading in Jeremiah, the vision continues with God digging things up and tearing things down and even destroying whole nations. Again, in Jeremiah's vision, not a historical account, but a vision. God digging things up and tearing them down, not gentle at all. And when I was reading the text and reflecting on how it wasn't gentle. Suddenly, that rosy veneer of charming childhood memories lifted away just enough that I could see myself again sitting at the potter's wheel on Great Plain Avenue. But this time, I could see and I could remember those moments when frustration pushed me to the brink of tears those moments when the clay was too wet or too dry or my unpracticed hands couldn't quite make the right shape. I remembered how time after time after time I would find myself pressing my half-formed creation back into a shapeless ball and starting again. I remembered the lids that didn't quite fit the pots anymore once the clay was fired. I remembered the embarrassment of needing the teacher to sit down and fix some mistake that I couldn't fix. I remembered really what an uneven process creation really is, full of doing and undoing, redoing, messing up, starting over. 
and finding yourself completely overwhelmed. So this vision of the prophet Jeremiah, God the potter and us the clay, being reworked and torn down and started again being smushed back onto the wheel for another attempt. It's not a threat. I think we could read this text and hear it as a threat from God. It's not a threat. It's a reality check. The vision is not a threat. It's not God's way of saying, be good or else I might crush you and start over. It's God's way of saying this, all growth, all change, all new creation is hard and it requires loss. And that's not a threat, it's a fact. After I graduated from seminary, Molly and I loaded up everything from our apartment into a U-Haul to drive up to Boston for my first job as a minister in Wellesley. I still remember that last moment standing on the sidewalk in Manhattan underneath this towering castle-like building where I had lived and worked and played and worshipped and grown for three years. The library where I had first encountered the new theological ideas, the apartment where Molly and I first built our life together, the classrooms where I was challenged, the chapel where I found this voice the pub where we stayed up late, embroiled in lively and occasionally brash theological debates. All of it was in that moment tucked behind those two doors and I was standing on the sidewalk. And I remember realizing in that moment that I would never, ever be able to go back. Sure, I could visit the building, and I have. And I see those people all the time, but that community and precisely what it was in that moment in my life, it's, it's gone now. And at the same time, standing on the sidewalk, looking at those two closed doors, there are a few moments in my life when I have felt more excited about the future. And all of that was all mixed up together, and I felt it so acutely while I was standing there with what felt like my whole life sitting in a truck. And over the next few years, my first few years in the parish, some of those pots that felt perfect and done when I was graduated were suddenly being squeezed again and ruined a little bit, it felt like. And some, some of the things were about to be pressed all the way back down into little lumps of clay. I think it's tempting to look at our lives and think that it's all just little touch-ups. It was tempting for me to believe that I had been well-formed by seminary and I was going to go to a church and just smooth off a couple rough places, make it a little more perfect. But that's not how it goes. Every change and all growth and all new creation, it's hard and it requires loss. And that's not a threat, it's a fact. I also want to pause here for a moment so that you can hear loud and clear what I am not saying. I am not saying that every hard thing and every loss is God trying to make us grow. I'm not saying that everything happens for a good reason or that there is some silver lining to every cloud. Sometimes hard things and bad things and tragic things are just that. 
and God's place in those moments is right beside us to comfort us and love us and help us put the broken pieces back together, not every hard thing that happens is God trying to change us. Sometimes hard things are just hard things, and God is there loving us through it. What I am saying is that every time God helps us grow, it requires loss. That while not all hard things in our lives come from God, some of them might. Sometimes it's that thing that's the hardest to walk away from or the hardest to let go of that's holding you back from the growth that God desires for you. Sometimes that feeling that everything is coming apart might be a sign that God is at work in your life creating something new, that something new is opening for you. And if you can muster the courage to step across that threshold and step into the new thing that is being created in you, something will get smushed. Perhaps even pressed all the way back down into a little lump of clay. That's how it goes. All growth, all change, all new creation is hard and it requires loss. So a long, long, long time ago, God sent Jeremiah a vision of a potter sitting at his wheel, pressing the clay back down into a lump and starting again. You know, every week here after our prayers, we sing to God, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. This is the melt me part. And it's the least fun, and it's the hardest. But it's a fact of what it means to follow God. That to reshape our lives for the sake of others and the world, something gets lost in the refining, and it could be something that we hold quite dear. And I really don't think that God is telling us all of that out of anger to scare us. I think God is telling us that out of love so that we'll be ready. I do. 